Why is there a pizza on the wall? This is Saturn V. It's the first game from Cosmo D, an independent developer who in the past half decade has made some of my favorite first person games. This one's from 2014. It's pretty basic compared to the stuff he's made since then. You walk around a building as ethereal music plays. The song, a piece by Cosmo D's band, Archipelago, changes as you explore the building. Different parts fade in and out. Outside the windows, a massive planet looms over you. But inside the building, there isn't much rhyme or reason to the level design. Just a lot of junk lying around. This is the only one of Cosmo D's games that isn't available on Steam, and I think that's because it's full of images he doesn't own the rights to. There's a Homer Simpson mural, there are stickers from well-known craft breweries, there's a scan of a pandemic expansion, and there's a pizza on the wall. Over the years, Cosmo D's games have become increasingly interested in the player's relationship with food. A year after Saturn V, Cosmo D released Off Peak, a game set in a wildly surreal train station. You explore the station, attempting to find and reassemble the shreds of a boarding pass so you can catch the next train out. There are merchants in the station, and one is selling pizza. You can eat every available slice if you want. There's no way to pay, though, so the chef is annoyed if you do that. We've gone from seeing food to eating food. In Cosmo D's next game, The Norwood Suite, released in 2017, you travel to a vibrant hotel on the verge of takeover by a mysterious corporation called the Medulo. You need to get into a party in the basement, but the bouncer won't let you in without a costume. So you spend your night tracking down the piece of a costume, running errands for the Hotel Norwood's guests and workers. A pair of the Medulo's lawyers really want a sandwich, but the chef isn't on duty. So you make them one, rounding up a head of lettuce, tomato, a ball of mozzarella, and a full turkey. Then, slamming everything into a hydraulic press, and assembling the flattened ingredients on a brioche bun. We've gone from seeing food, to eating food, to making food. And in Tales from Off Peak City Volume 1, one of my favorites from a couple years ago, making food becomes your full-time job. As the game begins, you arrive at the corner of July Avenue and Yam Street, a lively intersection in one corner of the title city. You take a job at the local pizza joint, Saitano Slice. Orders come in on a CRT on the counter, and you do your best to fill them, sprinkling ingredients like marinara, mozzarella, basil, pepperoni, and mushrooms until the pizza looks just right. The thing is, though, those orders aren't concrete requests. None of them are as simple as supreme or Hawaiian or meat lovers. Instead, your orders sound more like proverbs, like a fortune cookie wasn't a reward for finishing your meal, but the instructions for making it in the first place. Study the form. Embrace the formation, says Lucas Belmont of 47 Yam Street. We must, as always, consider the source, says Jeremy Grensley at 26 July Avenue. Right in the chest, says Murga, 14 July Avenue, Suite 4. Whatever you cook up, your customers are happy to receive it. Walk the pizza down the street to their door, and they will ruminate with you on the creative beauty of whatever choice you made. These customers aren't demanding. They would never even think to send a pizza back or ask for a refund. Saitano Slice, in a real way, is a beautiful intersection of art and commerce, a place where orders are based on vibes and customers are willing to dole out money so that you can take poetic license with their meal. But in his latest game, Betrayal at Club Low, Cosmo D takes the idea even further. In the isometric RPG, which takes inspiration from games like Disco Elysium, you again make pizza however you want. But this time, the pizza is almost entirely utilitarian. Each pie becomes a die, which you roll to accomplish a goal, and which generates cash for you to spend to upgrade your stats. This is maybe the logical endpoint of Cosmo D's portrait of the relationship between art and commerce. You're free to make whatever pizza you want, and in that way it is self-expression. But the kind of pizza you will want is inevitably the kind that will earn you money. Only certain kinds of self-expression are useful here. Cosmo D's games aren't just about food, though. In this world, artistic disciplines are constantly blending together. Down the street from Saitano Slice, there's a stoop sale where you can buy a camera, and as you deliver pizzas around town, you'll find new kinds of film which lend your pictures new and unusual exposures. So Tales from Off Peak City invites us to be photographers, too. When we make a pizza, each ingredient is represented by a different musical tone. Add marinara and a violin run played. Mm. Mm. 
layer on the cheese and you'll hear a guitar being strummed. Put some basil on and it's a snare drum. Pepperoni gets you a xylophone. After you finish adding an ingredient, its sound becomes a persistent part of a musical track that builds throughout the process. So, Tales from Off Peak City invites us to be musicians, too. The link between food and music is one that Cosmo D established early on in his work. In Off Peak's drain station, we meet a ramen chef who tells us, The protein of any meat is a powerful and tonally dominant sustenance. Woodwinds are the glue of an orchestra, and so too are shallots, cabbage, spinach, seaweed, and my ramen. These games tell stories about creativity, about the artistic scenes that emerge when enough creative people get together in one place. Cosmo D's settings feel like writer's workshops, artist colonies, band camps. You might find a pair of scientists dreaming up strange new energy drink flavors, or you might meet a creatively frustrated jingle composer who longs to stretch herself with non-commercial music. Or you might meet a photographer aching for more fulfilling work. These places feel like they would inspire that kind of creativity because they are the products of immense creativity themselves. I mean, look at them. Cosmo D's games are unlike anything else I've ever played. They're surreal, but utterly grounded at the same time. His settings feel like real places. Careful consideration has been paid to architecture and history, but at the same time these games feel like a source engine fever dream. Off Peak's train station feels like an artistic petri dish, a fertile culture where musicians, chefs, artists, and board game designers have come to flower. The Hotel Norwood once served as the residence of Peter Norwood, a revered musician who disappeared without a trace in 1983. During his life, the musicians he played with and mentored stayed here. Now that he's gone, it's become a creative mecca, attracting a touring rock band, that jingle composer I mentioned before, a music history class on a field trip, and a DJ, in the process of playing his 300th consecutive weekend show. In Tales from Off Peak City Volume 1, our scene expands further, spreading through the nearby shops and homes. The rock band from the Norwood Suite is back, but the streets are also inhabited by an aspiring actor, a would-be chef, professor, and a saxophonist who traded in his axe for a pizza cutter. As idyllic as Saitano's Slice is, a place where the pizza artist is free to make the kind of pizza they want for grateful customers, the artistic scenes in Cosmo D's work are frequently undercut by the forces at work both outside them, in the structure of the society they occupy, and inside them, in the structure of the scene itself. Sometimes it's capitalism. Sometimes it's the self-important creative leader at the center of the scene. These artistic scenes are guided by influential figures who loom large over the creative output of the artists, tastemakers who have curated the art that surrounds them. In the Norwood Suite, it's Peter Norwood, whose blessing and mentorship meant the world to the musicians he invited out to his home. Then, years later, it's Nadia, the Spitfire manager who has rebuilt the hotel from obscurity in the decades that followed Norwood's disappearance, giving that workaholic DJ a career in the process. In off-peak, it's Marcus, the proprietor of the train station. We meet him on a balcony, overlooking the railroad, flanked by two massive goons sitting on a literal throne. I get solicitations for businesses all over the city begging to have a piece of the real estate here. He says, These businesses try to dazzle me with sales charts, press clippings, and bribes. But I just laugh in their face. They don't get that I'm a curator. I deem each business worthy of the needs and tastes of my customers. Not all of these businesses will do equally well, but I do not care. The tastes and whims of my customers are what's important to me. All else. Peter Norwood has a mixed legacy. Remembered by the outside world as a talented and important musician. Remembered by those who knew him, it's implied, as an abusive jerk. The daughter of one of Norwood's musicians is staying in the Norwood suite with her now old and ailing father. She alludes to the way Norwood treated his musicians, communicating that violent or at least unprofessional behavior was part of the great pianist's legacy. It isn't just the tastemakers sabotaging their own scenes, though. These games are filled with frustrated artists who have shelved their dreams for something more marketable. That ramen salesman we met in Off Peak, he gave up a career as a musician to put in long, grueling shifts behind the counter. In the Norwood Suite, it's the jingle writer who has lost her ability to think in musical chunks larger than 60 seconds. She's just looking for a blank sheet of paper so she can compose something grander again. 
In Tales from Off Peak City, we have our flavor scientists, who haven't had a new flavor accepted by the energy drink company they work for in a long time. Over and over again, we meet creative people who are frustrated by the needs of the market, and more directly, the needs of their bosses. As the Norwood Suite begins, we quickly learn that lawyers from the Medulo have descended on the Norwood Suite, hoping to purchase the location. Their leader, Courtney, plans to turn the place into a server farm. An important historical site, which is still stirring up creativity in a new crop of artists, will be transformed into something utilitarian. Corporation flexes, and the scene gets choked out. Then there's Jeremy, the other side of the capitalist coin. Jeremy is one of the members of a rock band in Tales from Off Peak City. Jeremy is able to focus on his music, but only because his parents work for The Factory, the shadowy company that looms large over the game. It's a black hole, sucking in every willing worker in the area. Its ubiquity gives it unique power. It will pay your bills, but it's kind of the only game in town. Jeremy can follow his dreams because his parents gave in to the factory. In Cosmo D's work, corporations give and take away, and we have little say about it. These games are surreal and dreamlike, but just as much, they are deeply rooted in the concrete reality of the struggling artist. In an ocean of exploited labor and crappy jobs, these games say here, do the art that you want. Make us the pizza you want, even if it's topped with chocolate chips, gummy worms, and martini olives. We'll find something to like about it.